Chapter 4 Indian Fires John Minders rode down after lunch, carrying his musket in his hands, balancing it on the withers of his bright bay horse. He called for Gertrude to come out, and she closed the door behind her so that the children, looking through the window, could not hear what was said. The sun was warmer now and the wind was dying down and the bay horse rested his hip while Minders talked down to their mother. She tilted her face up at him, looking young and small and worried. Tunis says to tell you everything is all right, but the French Indians are burning the upper settlements. People have been killed. They have sent a company from Albany to the flats. The company will stop them all right, Gertrude. What are you doing? Tunis wanted to let you know that is all. I am riding over to the Van Epps and to my own place, but Tunis thinks maybe you had better go over to the big house. Minders looked down at her. He won't get back tonight either, probably. Tell him not to worry about us. We are fine. He looked away from her as she squared her shoulders. Tell me, does he want anything? Minders shook his head. Oh yes, I forgot. He wants his schnapps in the wood flask. Doesn't he want any food? Any bread? He didn't say, but we could use food. There are quite a lot of us. Just a minute. She flew into the house to get the schnapps. Get the big loaf of bread, Trudy, and you get the ham. The big one at the end, Edward. In a moment, they had the food ready for Minders. He put the flask over his shoulder and the loaf in his bag and took the ham in his arm. Just like my baby, he said, grinning at the children. And they laughed soberly. They watched him clop away up the road leaving deep tracks in the mud. And Edward said, Minders does not ride like father. He is like a flower sack sitting on a horse. Oh, you must not say such things about Minders. He is very kind. Trudy clapped her hands and had commented that the Indians don't wear breeches. And she sang it until she was hushed up and was sullen and went around muttering something. Edward finally asked her what she said, and she answered in a deep voice, Burgom op zoom. He looked up at the Spanish gun at once. It seemed like a cannon with the afternoon light shining through the window along the whole length of it. He thought they need not be afraid with that in the house. Gertrude said, Let us go out for a little walk. Where to? Oh, just for some air, and then we can get in the cows. They went out, and to please Trudy, allowed her to wear the old shawl so that she looked like a comical dwarf woman with fat legs. The children chattered all the way along, and Gertrude had no trouble in leading them up the knoll beyond the garden. It was quite a high rise of ground. From the top of it, one could see out clear into the north and the east. The sun was halfway down, and the west wind, though it was much milder, was like a stream against their cheeks. The children saw the smoke as soon as Gertrude did. It was a leaning cloud far in the north. They could see it as plain as the horizon. Is it far away? The children asked. Oh, yes, Gertrude was straining her eyes. She tried to imagine where it came from. She thought it was much nearer than the north settlements. Near the flats, she thought, since it showed so distinctly. Is it a big fire, Mama? Yes, I, I think so. Edward was silent. They walked down together with the wind cold in their faces and saw the cows by the creek. Come, cried Gertrude. We must get them in. I'll get them, said Edward. No, we'll all get them. Hurry! Trudy ran, waving a stick and screeching, Burgom, up, zoom! But Edward kept watching his mother. He knew now that she was afraid. Are the Indians near, Mama? Not very. She made her voice sound calm. Luckily, the cows were eager to be brought in. They fastened them and went into the house. Then Trudy was sent to wash her face, and Gertrude called Edward. She looked pale and serious. I think the Indians are quite near, Edward. You must not go out any more. Why don't we go over to Grandmother's? It is better here, she thought of an excuse. If Papa comes back, he would want to find us at home, Edward. Chapter 5 Loading the Gun She had thought out her course while getting the cows. It was better to stay. Their place was away from the main road, and raiders would be more likely to know and see the brick house. She knew that she could not help the grandmother, who would not want her help in any case, and she thought only of the best way to keep the children safe. To stay seemed the best way to her. Trudy's shouting had given her an idea for defending the house, for it seemed to her that if the Indians came, they would not arrive as far as this except in small groups. Edward, 
I want you to be a brave boy and do everything I tell you. Yes, Mama. Would you be afraid to fire Great Grandfather's gun? Edward looked up at the Spanish matchlock, all the great length of it, and said with a white, excited face, No, Mama, but I can't hold it. Oh, I can fix that, she said. But you must do exactly what I say. She bent over to the fireplace and mounted a stool and took down the huge gun. It was beginning to grow dusky in the Kill Valley already, and the kitchen had turned dark and shadowy. She lit a candle. Fetch the big powder horn. She had no idea how much powder to put into the gun, but she doubled what seemed to her a musket charge. She wadded it down with a piece of writing paper, standing at the end of the barrel and pushing the rod because of the length of the gun. It hasn't any bullets, Edward said. See if there are some with Papa's mold. Edward found two. They rolled down the barrel with a faint rattling sound. Gertrude was not satisfied. She leaned the gun on a chair and told Edward to not let Trudy touch it. Trudy came in at the moment and as soon as she saw the gun, she stopped. For once, she was speechless. Gertrude rummaged, finding some horseshoe nails and some small pebbles and two brass buttons. She rammed them all down and wadded them hard. Then she got Tunis's axe and chopped out a corner of the blind of the window at the left of the stoop door. With Edward helping, she dragged the table to the window and then lifted the gun onto it. And then with all her flat irons, propped the gun so that it pointed to the missing corner of the blind, straight out onto the steps of the stoop. Then she bolted the blinds, not only of that window, but of the other windows as well, and dropped the bar over the shed door. She had become very silent in doing these things and so had the children watching her. Edward trembled a little when she drew a stool up to the table and told him to get onto it. Then she primed the gun and set the candle beside it. Seeing the whole thing complete, Trudy suddenly said with great acuteness in her usual loud voice, Bergom op zoom. Hush, said Gertrude. Trudy, you must not talk. You must play on Mama and Papa's bed. She made a doll out of a handkerchief and got a large lump of maple sugar and then some silver spoons and put them and Trudy together on the bed, leaving the door open so that she would not be frightened. The little girl settled down in delight on the big bed and held her doll up so she could see and whispered, Pergum op zoom, very softly. Okay, everyone, that's going to do it for chapters four and five of The Matchlock Gun by Walter D. Edmonds, and it is illustrated by Paul Lance. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this so far. I'm really sorry that it took so long to get these two chapters up. I had a lot going on in my life recently, and I just was not able to get it done. And then when I was going to get it done, I forgot to grab the book. So I had to wait until this weekend to be able to read and record it. And I'll tell you what, this chapter 4 and 5 was not easy to record. So anyway, I hope that you enjoy it. Just keep staying tuned, and I will get uh, probably the rest of this book done all in one fell swoop when I get home next. I hope that you all are doing well, that you are staying safe, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye now.